So I would like to thank the organizers first for inviting me over. And they asked me to share some of my experience with the genus Rushula with you. Now, the first thing I would like to say is that I'm so happy that this microflora project is going to happen, not only because North America really would need a microflora or a funga, if you like, but especially because everybody else in the world needs it, needs this information so much because this, this is going to learn us a lot about the biogeography of our fungi. Now, I cited three examples here. I showed you three species here that belong to species groups that we lack in Europe. You have so many more groups over here in North America than we have in Europe. We lost most of those. So the first one, for example, Rachula compacta, will be in an undescribed yet unpublished subgenus, new subgenus, and it has no close species in the northern hemisphere. The closest thing to this mushroom are growing in Madagascar and in Africa. And you, you can say the same thing about the middle, which is Rachula eccentrica. You have more than one species in the southern states. And this is also present in the tropics and also in Papua New Guinea. Uh, um, and then, for example, the third one is Rachula ochre compacta, which is no longer a Rachula. It is now multifurca. And it is distributed in India, China, Thailand, and New Caledonia. So your flora will help a lot in understand these uh, different patterns. Where do I have to put? Is it not with the? Uh, it's big. Yeah, okay. No, it's because it was. So, from where comes my interest in North American rushulas? Well, it all, all goes back to the MSA meeting in Vancouver, where Roy Halling asked me if I wouldn't like to have a look at his collections from Rushula from Costa Rica and Colombia. And I said yes, without knowing the implications. Because <laughs> as soon as I started looking at these things, I realized that it was impossible to work on this part of the world if I, have not, if I would have not a better idea of the things that are growing in the eastern states and in the southeast in particular. So that's why I started to look at North American Rushulas and from 2000 onwards I came at least once a year for a short trip over to the states. Now the big problem compared to Pheocolibia is that Rushula is such a tremendous genus. You can consider it the Cortinarius of the warmer climates. You, here you have a cake that gives you the distribution of about 6,000 published names within the Rushulales, and you see the portion that is taken by Rushula. It's a huge, huge genus. So how many taxa are, are we talking about in the US? When I started to, to my study of North American Rushulas, uh, I looked at the published taxa, and at that time, 2000, early 2000s, you had already 329 described taxa, native taxa and an additional 87 recognized European species. So you had already, I started already with 460 different recognized entities in the United States alone. That is far more that it, than the species present in Fanga Nordica or in other European monographs. So you have a very high diversity. And where were they described from? Well, you see, that's where the main mycologist, active mycologist on Russell lived. The 112 in Florida is a very, very narrow area around Gainesville where Merrill collected. And then you have that, the Northeast, where you have 58 species published by Burlingham and 47 by Peck. And then you see that nearly all the rest of the United States is virgin territory. I mean, they are virtually unexplored. And when you look at the different climates and the different vegetation types, you can be sure that the, that the rushulas that are growing in the other parts of, the, of uh, the United States will be very different from the ones that are described up to this very day. So identification, it's easier said than done. There are several problems. Nearly all of the available species descriptions lack modern precision. The best and shortest species description comes from Schaefer, from Singer, I'm sorry, who said, Cap, red, step, stipe, white, deciduous woods. And that was it. <laughs> and that is for a very difficult group, the Russian Xerampolina group. Oh. Now, you can imagine. But for most species, we really have only a few lines that describe the morphology. And as a consequence, European keys are used without critical observation. And the majority, and this is a very big problem, the majority of the Russians in the USA is still undescribed. And we'll show you, I will go on deeper into this. 
And then finally, there are no living local experts on American Russia list anymore. Since Fatto died, and Singer died, there is Schaefer, but he's not active anymore. So there is nobody interested in Russia anymore. And the main interest in Russia is kicking it when you collect it. So now one big description is that in, Europe, in Europe, we have an older tradition of working with amateur mycologists, or what you call citizen scientists now. And you see in red, this is the American, the timeline for uh, the United States. So it starts at the end of the 18th century and it stops here at 2004 or something. In red are professional mycologists and in green are the uh, amateur mycologists who contributed to SAFER. So you see Burlingham is the exception. She was a biology, biology teacher, I think. So you can consider her citizen scientist. But there is virtually no participation. When you compare this to Europe, then you see that professional mycologists stopped uh, to be interested in Russia around the 50s, 60s. And from then onwards, all the work, all the monographs, all the revisions, everything is done by amateur mycologists. And up to date, there is, including me, I'm not really interested in working anymore on European rationalists. They are sufficiently taken care of by the amateur community. And so you have in Europe now these meetings, and Andy was there in 2010, and also Ron brought Karen to, looking for a new subject for the late evening talks. <laughs> and we have these meetings where you have now a large group of people from all over Europe that gather together and study one particular group. And they exist, for example, for Russia. There are Russia meetings, as there are polypore meetings and Eskomycete meeting, meetings and uh, Cortisiesi meetings. And one of the important aspects of these meetings is that you have exchange of terminology, of concepts, and of how methodology, and it makes the approach of a genus much more homogeneous. It's very important that everybody understands one another when you are talking about dermatocystidia, that you are correctly understood by somebody else. So that's why these meetings, I think, are very important. And I think that's the way to go also for large genera in uh, America. Now, two examples <coughs> uh, of what to expect when you start looking at Rushula. This is the circumscription of subgenus Ingratula in North America. In white, you have the native species. In red, you have the so-called European taxa present in the US. Now, molecularly, this is not really published, but molecularly, this subgenus is sized down to what you see here in green, so three subsections. And if you look now at, in 2004, what I will show you now, this phylogram is a combined ITS LSU uh, tree for these three subsections based on my collections actually only. In green you see, uh, is this green here or is it yellow? Do you see yellow or is it? Well, the pale green then, because it should be yellow. The pale green is uh, United States. Then you have a darker orange. I hope you can see it more or less. It's Central America. I went once with Roy Holling to Costa Rica and once with Alejandro Conluz to Mexico. And then the bluish uh, green, the much more darker things are Europe. Now, what this thing shows, the published names are there, but what this says essentially that from my collections alone, over the few times that I was here, you have more than 30 undescribed taxa in this thing only, be, be, not only in the United States, but also in uh, Central America. But so it's a huge job that is awaiting you here. Now, the problem when you have all these taxa to name and you have no idea of what has been described, the first thing is you have to have this idea of what has been described. So I stopped doing all these trees and uh, I'm continuing the, the sequencing, but I want to do type studies first because it is so important that you know what has been done before. And so now I'm publishing here, you see some of the examples of the 2011 and 2012 papers that recently came out on type studies in Russia. And for example, in Merrill's material, I found already completely ignored species in this ingratular group. So it is, this is very important. And it is also very important to do morphology because it allows you to identify Russia, finally, if you have a good study, uh, based solely on morphology. 
And for example, this is a Russia letter that was sent to me by Arlene Besset, who is now living in Georgia. And she says, oh, I found my, such a beautiful pink Russia letter. What is it? Can you tell me what it is? So I looked at it, and uh, there were some notes. And it says it was smelling like a bakery. So that narrowed down, perhaps, already my search among the pink Russia list. And by pure chance, I had done the type study of something that looked exactly the same. And this is what you see is the first published picture of Russia Hicksonia. It has never been found again. And what is important, especially, is that I could give a name. Because if you want to motivate citizen scientists to participate in long-term projects, you have, to be, you have to be able to give some positive return. They expect to have some names from time to time. If you can only say, oh yes, I have sequenced this thing, I know it, I have plenty of sequences of this, that won't do. I mean, they, they will get frustrated even more. You have to be able to give names, and that's very important. Now, the second example is actually the first thing I did. It, when I was at Oslo MSA meeting, Rita Vilgelis told me, why don't you try to do some molecular work? Come to my lab and we do some extraction and amplification. Tim here, Tim James, he knows what I'm talking about. So I went there with a very small project, and the project was how to differentiate between Russula crustosa, a so common Russula, and virescence. Morpholo morphology was completely mixed up. Nobody was able to differentiate between those two. So finally, this is a selection of more than 140 specimens base, uh, sequenced for ITS. And then I took samples of these. And then we have now four genes. And this is the combined tree. And what we end up is a very distinctive Russula crustosa, a distinctive Russula virescence in America, which is not our European Russula virescence, and 12 other undescribed species that you have here in the States and that we do not have in Europe. So once again, we go from two species to almost 15, if you add some things from Costa Rica. Once again, morphology is important, because when you get those trees, you want to explain, you want to understand what these trees are telling you. And so I looked at all these things, and I can understand why morphologically you can't really find the differences if the genes don't tell you first how they really have to be. Uh, put in separate parts, but when you look hard, you can see that the Russula crustosa group, all the species in that group have dermatocystidia up to the sub into the subpellis, whereas the virescence group has no dermatocystidia or only dermatocystidia near the surface. So these are really small details, not easy things to see, but at least when you do your molecular work after the genes told you how things are separated, you can find good characters that later you can put into a key and citizen scientists can use to at least come to approximate identifications. So I use description forms for macroscopy and also for microscopical uh, features that are up my website in PDF form that people can download and use or that they can use uh, as inspiration for their own. Um, forms if they want to make them. I also use an, uh, an explanation for how to take tissues for some, um, some aspects, such as how to number your specimens, your Eppendorf tubes, is very important. Some people start every year again with one, two, three, four, five species in CTAP. Use, so there are things you have to explain to avoid later confusion between, oh, what are these things that all are one and two and three? And so there is a lot of confusion that you can avoid by giving good explanations of how to do it. And finally, very important also is to be able to give keys, even if you have provisional identification keys, for example, for the virescence group, although I have finished the work in 2005, I never came to publish it. Uh, it will be published very soon, I hope. But there is a provisional identification key on the web since 2005, giving already these unpublished names and enabling pe people to try out these provisional identification keys. And you get key feedback, and you can finally come up when you have finished your work with a better key than you had uh, at the beginning. So thank you for listening to me, and thanks to all these people. You will see a lot of amateur mycologists have helped me through my stays here. Also in the lab, I have been helped 
because I was not at all a molecular person, I still really not am, I'm a more field person, I think people who helped me with type studies, especially Adam Chick, who I could um, persuade to help me with looking at these 300 and I forgot already, 329 different Rus type specimens for native Russians here. Uh, we have a project to, start to complete this within five years. And then I have things also up on the website, on a website, Russia Lely's News, that is also completely volunteer work. I had some funding, very limited funding, mainly air tickets to the US. And I have been profiting for sequencing from a project in uh, the museum in Paris where we had for a few years, unfortunately it stopped unlimited sequencing. So I have been able to sequence hundreds, many hundreds of my collections for several genes thanks to this thing and so now the fruits will be, we will be able to collect fruits from this in the coming years. Thank you. <laughs>